Hello and welcome to Dev Superpowers. My name is Brendan Richards, I'm a Solution Architect at SSW and this Dev Superpowers is all about Onion Architecture and how to go about implementing Onion Architecture within Entity Framework. And specifically um, how to match the ideals and ideas of Onion Architecture with the reality of um, the implementation you're given by default with Entity Framework. So I'm going to start by briefly talking about why we have these conversations about architecture in the first place. And for me, the reason is spaghetti code. I found a very good quote online, um, and the quote says, In spaghetti code, the relations between the pieces of code are so tangled that it is nearly impossible to add or change something without unpredictably breaking something somewhere else. And I think any experienced developer will have experienced um, this at some point where you start off with the best of intentions, you set up along your path, you don't plan to make spaghetti code, but over time, croft and, and changes accumulate on your system until you're left with spaghetti code. So in order to avoid spaghetti code, we use a number of techniques in order to organize where we put the various components of our system. So if we want to avoid making spaghetti code, Let's first look at how easy it is to make spaghetti code. And the secret sauce here is dependencies. Um, you start by making a thing, a class, something in your system that performs some kind of operation. And then um, these things are generally useless on their own. You make another thing that performs another task. And then to make them work together, you make your first thing, A, have a dependency, it needs to use thing B. That's fair enough. But as soon as you turn around and also make thing B need thing A, then those two components are locked together and very, very hard to pick apart. And you now have spaghetti code. So the key issue is managing those dependencies. Be clear about which pieces of your code depend on others. So this slide illustrates how Onion Architecture organizes the dependencies within our system. We imagine our system as a series of concentric rings where each layer of the ring takes dependencies from the inner layers, building out until you have the complete system. So in the center of our onion architecture design, we have the domain entities layer. Now domain entities are .NET classes that model the things that you are trying to describe in your system. In this case, things like customers, products, and orders. What's important here is to use language that makes sense to the business as a whole. The other rule that I generally apply around domain entities is that these classes should contain no external dependencies. That doesn't mean they can't contain logic, and actually in general, I'll put as much logic as I can within those domain entities. But as soon as that logic requires an external dependency, then that should be pushed out to one of the outer layers. For example, if it was possible for it to calculate the full cost of an order without an external dependency, I would put that inside the main entities. But if I had to go out to an external service to look at what the current special offers were, then that would have to go out into a business logic layer. Moving out from the domain entities in the center of your Onion architecture, all the other system components are wired into various layers of the Onion as interfaces. So all the communication between components of your system happen through the interfaces and the actual concrete runtime implementations of those interfaces are loaded via a dependency injection system. In this case, I'm going to be showing you Autofac, but there's plenty of other good ones out there. Using interfaces across your code base, um, no matter what architecture you're using, is something I'd always encourage. Um, certainly, I find as personally as developer, uh, if I um, am connecting two pieces of code together, I'll always stop and think more carefully about the communication between two pieces of code if I'm building an interface around it. Um, also, you get the ability to more clearly test things and certainly unit tests. You can add, inject mock examples in, in the case of your unit tests. So if you do have tests down in the business logic layer that does have dependencies on your repositories, you can mock those repositories out and just focus on just what that business logic class should be doing. 
So to recap on my introduction to onion architecture, I'll start with the definition from Jeffrey Palermo himself. Onion architecture is an architectural pattern where the core object model is represented in a way that does not accept dependencies on less stable code. It's a domain centric design. I'm choosing my words very carefully here because this is not a talk about domain driven design, although that does build heavily upon these concepts. Um, but I'm talking about domain centric design in the way that um, the core of our system is a set of .NET classes. We're talking about the classes first, we're not looking at the database yet, although later on I'm going to show you how to implement that database. Um, so that's a very distinct difference to your classic end-tier application where the core of your system is the database. All application components across your Onion architecture communicate via interfaces. And when you do that, you get the ability to independently test your components via unit tests. You use a dependency in injection framework such as uh, Autofac to wire all these components together. And then once you've implemented an Onion architecture, one of the big bonuses is knowing where your code should go and having a place ready for your code. So no matter where you, what your particular problem is, knowing where that component should go saves you a lot of time and a lot of headaches. The other rule of thumb I'd give you is to give yourself some rules and stick to them. It's so easy when you come close to crunch time to start forgetting about the beautiful architecture you've set for yourself early on. And it's when you start breaking those rules that you'll start adding new dependencies and starting to create spaghetti. Okay, so before moving on to Entity Framework itself, there are two more onion architecture concepts I want to introduce, and those are the repository and the unit of work. So a repository is a single object implementation for restoring and retrieving a single type of entities. So it really is a, a wrapper layer between your domain entities and whatever persistent store you're using. In our case, we're going to be using an SQL server with Entity Framework but it is an abstraction there that sits between your code and that persistence layer. So the rule of thumb we apply here is um, generally a repository is for a single entity type. If you need to work on multiple objects together, I generally put that in a business layer. Then the unit of work pattern is what we use when we're performing multiple actions across multiple repositories to wrap that up into a single Unit, unit of work, and um, what we're really talking about here in the database context is transactions, database transactions. But the unit of work is our abstraction for that, and that abstraction could apply when you're not in a database context. Okay, so now I've given you a brief overview of Onion Architecture and the core concepts there. I'm going to take, take a step away from Onion Architecture and do a brief code introduction to Entity Framework. So Entity Framework is an Object Relational Mapper, or ORM. It's the job of an ORM to take entities as described as plain old .NET objects and convert those to and from a SQL database persistent store. So for the purposes of this code demonstration, I've come up with a very, very simple object model, mainly to show them the differences between one-to-one -one and one-to-many relationships. So, so far what we've got here is one student can have many enrollment, and obviously each school has multiple students, so one each school has multiple enrollments, and it's via the enrollments table that students and schools are related. So when we go into the code, we can see here I've created a simple domain project, that's a plain .NET library class, and each of these entities is modeled as a single class. Looking at the students, you can see the relationship between students and enrollments is modelled as a typed collection. And again, in the same way, the relationship between enrollments and students and enrollments and schools are straightforward property. One thing to point out, which I'll come to later, is that inside Entity Framework, these relationships are marked as virtual. That becomes important later when we start talking about lazy loading, so I'll show you that very soon. Now, previous versions of Entity Framework actually came in a few versions. There was database first, model first, and code first. 
and it works pretty much as you expect. Database first is where you could point entity framework and the existing database. It would read those tables and generate um, code to model from the database. Model first, you had an EDMX file, which was a XML file that contained mapping information. And from that EDMX file, you could generate both the database and entity classes. Whereas code first starts with the code. Now, for the purposes of dealing with Onion architecture and its domain-centric approach, our, my, my opinion is code first is the much better tool. And in fact, in future versions of Entity Framework, code first is pretty much the way you go. So when we're working with Entity Framework code first, what Entity Framework does is it reads our entity classes themselves along with their configuration. Now, there are a couple of ways to configure Entity Framework. First of all, there's configuration by convention. This field here, for example, has no additional configuration attached to it. It's just a date time field, a public date time field inside a class. Entity Framework will read that and understand that what you want in your database is a corresponding date time field. The first way to add additional information is with annotations. So this attribute here sets uh, this field to have a max length of 111 characters. The other way of adding configuration is via a Fluent interface, a Fluent API. This class here contains a Fluent configuration for the student class. As you can see, you've got a property, you've specified an expression to find the property and the has max length function sets the max length of this item to 222. Now if you have a string we don't provide any configuration for, it will put it in the database as varchar max. From the point of view of what's the best approach to work with onion architecture, I would say that the rule of onion architecture is you put as few dependencies into your domain classes as possible. So with that in mind, I would generally tell you to put your configuration inside external configuration classes using the Fluent API. That means if you, those classes uh, that model your domain have life beyond their use within Entity Framework, for example, you've got a totally different set of systems that say XML, you don't have anything locked in your domain entities that are Entity Framework configurations when you're not working in Entity Framework context. So now that we have some domain entities and we have some configuration, let's look at connecting up Entity Framework. So the first thing you need to do obviously is to install Entity Framework. And you'll notice what I've done here is I've got a separate project for my domain and a separate project for my Entity Framework implementation. I find that very important. One of the best ways to make sure you don't get your dependencies tangled is using different projects for the various layers because dependencies between projects, those references, can themselves only occur one way. So it's a good way of making it impossible for you to, to have bi-directional dependencies if you're pushing your various layers out into different projects. So moving inside my Entity Framework project, I'll now go to the most important class, which is the database context. So it's my own class that inherits from DB context. And in fact, the DB context itself, as described even by the um, documentation, it does itself represent a combination of unit of work and repository patterns as discussed earlier. So what the DB context contains running through it is some basic configuration. Here we've got lazy loading turned on, which I'll demonstrate later. We've then got this on model creating section. This really um, is where you can put in all, all your various different configurations. In this case, I've got this call here, um, add from assembly. So what this does is it performs an assembly scan for configuration classes. Here is that student configuration class I showed you earlier that uses the Fluent API. 
it's this line of code that will scan this project for all of uh, all the appropriate classes that have been registered in here and load all those configurations. Finally, for each of the entities we're going to be managing in this DB context, we've got a DB set reference. So a DB set reference is how we go about manipulating these objects in the database. So to recap, everything we do in Entity Framework happens within this database context. And this database context is very, very important to understand because what you don't do when you're working with inside Entity Framework is it's not a one-to-one -one mapping between how you would work with a database, just using raw SQL, and how Entity Framework, the context works. What happens with the Entity Framework context is as you load objects from that into that database context, those objects get loaded into the DB context as memory and the changes you make to those objects are tracked. You can load multiple objects and each of those objects that you load are tracked. And only at the very end, when you call save changes against that context, are all the changes you made to that date saved to the database. Okay, so the next class I'm going to show you within this um, Entity Framework implementation is the initializer. You set up an initializer inside Entity Framework via this global system.data.entity.database.setInitializer function. You pass in the type, which is the type of your own DB context, and you pass in an initializer class. In my case, I've created an initializer that overrides the standard one called drop create database always. This is a good initializer for initial testing because um, what it does is every time the initializer is runs, it drops the entire database and recreates it. So early on in your project, when you're still not quite sure what your entities are and what the relationships are between them, this is good. Obviously, later on, when you want to actually keep the stuff in your database, this is no good at all. But for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to show you this drop create always. And then on top of that, most initializers have what's called a seed. So even though I've deleted the database every time I've hit Entity Framework, this seed will go and introduce a couple of test objects for me to do my testing on. Okay, so let's run these examples. What I've created here is using XUnit, a small series of integration tests, um, just so we can actually run some real code into the real database and see what happens. And the very first test I've written is very simple. It's going to get me a, DDBit, a database context. You can see I've got it in a using statement here, so it gets opened and closed and managed properly. Then I'm going to, when I run this, I'm going to make sure that I've actually got some student records that have been seeded from my seed function. And that's pretty much it. So let's run that test. And that test eventually passed. Remember that um, because of our drop create database um, option that we've got set here, and um, when I ran that, it did drop the entire database and recreate the whole database from scratch. So with that done, let's take a look at the database and see what got created. Okay, so now I've opened that database in Server Management Studio, and you can see what Entity Framework has done for us in the database. For each of our persistent entity types, we've got a table, and each of those tables has the expected columns. Starting with the students, you can see we've got a first name field, and this was set to 111 as configured via a data annotation attribute. The last name field was set to 222, and that was configured via the Fluent API. And finally, date of birth had no configuration, but um, the configuration by convention meant that this was just turned into a not nullable date time. Next, I'm going to look at the enrollments table. If you remember from our architecture design, we had one student with a relationship to many enrollments, and each school also had many enrollments. There's two one-to-many relationships there. In the entities, 
that was modeled by uh, properties and property collections in the database that has been set up by our foreign keys. So enrollments, each enrollment has a foreign key to school and to student. They've been properly set up as foreign keys. And also under the indexes, you will see each of those foreign keys has been given indexes. So all the, all the settings you expect to see are there done for you. And I find that with this stuff being generated for me, I make few mistakes. So that's all pretty useful. Moving back to Visual Studio, um, the drop and create database features I've shown you so far is all well and good for early prototyping. But at some point, you're gonna want the things you put in your database to stay in the database. And so to move forward to that is when you need Entity Framework Code First migrations. So the Entity Framework Code First migration system will recognize changes you make to your model and configuration and then generate scripts to apply those changes to your database schema. To start, you go to the Package Manager console and you enable migrations via a PowerShell script. I'm going to show you the help screen for that now because I've already run migrations myself here. Once you've run migrations, you get a new folder. You've got a configuration file, and this gives you a siege function, pretty much the same as the seed you've already seen. It will also perform the initial migrations creation for you. Looking inside this migration file, everything you're looking at here has been generated for you. But what's great about the migration system is it generates this code, but then lets you make changes to it. Also, the code it generates, I find very readable. So it uses its own kind of um, domain-specific language here, all around the, the tasks of creating database tables, creating foreign keys. Each migration has two functions. There's an up function and a down function. So the up function will apply your change the down function will reverse it, and that becomes very useful as well, being able to roll back changes that the migration system makes to your database. Looking deeper into the migrations classes, you get a clue about how the migrations work. So um, the first thing to note is when you create a migration, you cannot just create a class here. You have to use the add migration script in the package manager console. That's because when you create a migration, opening up this file here, you see that there's a few resources and a designer here. If you open up the resource, you see there's a bit of a data blob there. So what um, Migrations does is it reads your entities, it reads the configuration, and it builds a binary blob that represents all that configuration and data. Now, the next time it's asked to perform a migration or to generate a migration, it'll create a new blob and compare those two blobs in order to work out what's changed, what changes do I need to make to the schema in order to update the database to the new system. So taking another look at our migration file, and you can see it's got all this code that creates tables and so forth. If you make a change to this um, code here, that will not impact the underlying storage here of what Entity Framework understands your model and configuration to be. So you can make any changes you like that better suit your database, provided they don't make your database incompatible with Entity Framework's understanding of what tables and column names you have. Following on from that, if you want to actually change the name of a field in the database as opposed to the property, the place to do that is inside the configuration. So what you would do in this case, we've got a last name field. If you wanted that in the database to have a different name, we can go to the configuration for that, put in a has column name, surname, for instance. If we were to save that and regenerate our migrations, we would then have our migration configuration and our actual entity config configuration in sync. If we were just to rename it inside the migration, that would fail because the next time you tried to query that object, Entity Framework would ask for a last name 
but there would be a surname field in the database. One thing you can and should write with inside your DB migrations is data motion scripts. Say for example you're renaming a column or you're converting a column type, all entity framework will see is a column being removed and a column being added. What you can do for yourself in the middle of those two operations is add the SQL to copy and transform values. And it's very easy to write any old SQL in here because you've got an SQL function. And inside there, you can put whatever SQL you need to write in order to perform your data migration. Moving on from the migrations, the next feature I want to show you is many-to-many -many relationships. Now these have to be mapped slightly differently in the database, and I'll show you how Entity Framework copes with those. But for the purposes of our entity, we've now got a student and a course entity with each student can map to many courses and each course can map to many students. Switching back to our code view, we can see that it's very, very easy to model those many-to-many -many relationships within our entities. All we need is a collection type of student on our course record and also in our student entity that has a corresponding many-to-many -many collection of courses. So this relationship is bi-directional and modelled simply through typed collections. Now when you want to model a many-to-many -many relationship inside the database, all you have are foreign keys. So in order to, to model many-to-many, -many, you have to create an intermediary table that contains foreign keys to both records. So for every single instance of a relationship between student and course, we get a new record inside this relationship table mapping courses to students. So once again, all we had to do was set up typed collections on the course and the student record and Entity Framework will automatically pick up that it needs to create this intermediary table, set up the appropriate foreign keys and the constraints and will also, coming back to here, generate the appropriate migration for you. Now the next thing I want to talk about is something I think anyone that goes near Entity Framework needs to, needs to understand and that's lazy loading. Rather controversially, lazy loading is turned on by default and that means that a lot of stuff when you're trying it out will work. But it's really important to understand what's being done for you here so that you don't get performance problems later. Lazy loading is quite easy to turn on. It's um, against the DB context, there's configuration dot lazy loading enabled equals true. And that turns it on for the for all relationships loaded by that DB context. So to demonstrate lazy loading. I've got a simple test here, written as an XUnit BD Defy test, which has got two halves. First of all, I'm opening a context. I'm loading one of the seeded entities, a student called Brendan. Then I'm going to add a couple of enrollments to that entity and save it at the end, all in one context. So that sets up my data. Then, in a second context, I'm going to just load that object and um, I'm going to put a breakpoint right there. So let's just run that code. So I'm running that code by debugging that unit test. Give it some time to load and run and hit my breakpoint. Remembering that's probably gonna initialize my database as well. Okay, so we've now hit that breakpoint. Let's just take a quick look at that Brendan object loaded from our DB context. Now where we're expecting this to be of type student, it's actually of system.data.entity.dynamicproxies.student and the big blob on the end. So it's got a long custom generated name. Now what a dynamic proxy is, is it's a way to dynamically inject new behavior into a class. So what happens is for my student class, it dynamically generates a subclass of student. And what it does inside that subclass is that any property that's a navigation property to another table, it mocks that out. So instead of loading all the um, enrollments, it just places a little placeholder in there. And the very first time, I then go and look up that relationship. So I've got a navigate from Brendan 
to the enrollments. At that point then is when it will fire a new database query to load those enrollments into the current context. So this lazy loading engine is both useful and dangerous. Um, useful in the fact I can load this student object, for example, without knowing as I'm loading it, what I'm going to use later. If just later I happen to just hit Brendan.enrollments, it will behind the scenes go far off the queries it needs to load that stuff in and I can carry on without having to know if that's happened. Um, the danger, of course, is if you're looping through a collection of uh, student records and each time in that loop you're hitting the enrollments collection, you're going to end up with lots and lots of database queries being fired off. And so in that case, you are much better off loading in advance. Another potential issue with Entity Framework is demonstrated by this very similar test. So in this case, I am, I've got a context, I am loading a student record, then I'm closing the context before walking down the object tree to go from students to enrollments. So let's see what happens here. So let it run. And what we're getting here is an object dispose exception. So um, in this case, we've got a persistent entity that was loaded by our context. It's got lazy loading turned on, so it's loaded as a dynamic proxy. But then the context is being closed before our dynamic proxy is trying to open that navigation properly. So with that context closed, this dynamic proxy can no longer query the database to fulfill that, that request to fetch the enrollments, and so we get this failure. Now there are a couple of approaches to work around this issue with, if you're trying to laser load with a detached object. Um, the first thing you can do is actually reattach it to a new context. So in this example, I've got a student record that I've loaded in the first context and I'm closing the context. I'm creating a second context and then I'm actually calling context or students to attach. So I'm attaching my entity to this new context. Then when I try and do this lazy loading uh, uh, load, and because it's now attached to a new context, that will work. Let me run that test to demonstrate. And that test passed. Another approach when dealing with lazy loading is of course to keep your DB context open for longer. Um, one pattern that's used quite often in web frameworks is context per request. So at some, so when you create a context within a web request, you keep that one context open for the whole lifetime of that web request and then close it at the end. Obviously that has a good advantage in that if say in your view, you follow a navigation property that you haven't before, that context will still be open and you'll be able to, to load that, in, that, that data. The disadvantage, of course, is if you're um, loading too many things via your lazy loading, you're going to get performance hits with this N plus 1 problem. So if all that lazy loading seems far too dangerous, you can always turn it off. So first of all, if you turn off lazy loading, then you load a object via your context then when, once that object is loaded, the actual collection will be null. If you don't want your navigation collections to be null with lazy loading turned off, your first option is eager loading. So when you initially um, specify your query to load your root object, um, the first you can do is add and include and specify the collections you want loaded with the first query. Um, this will also load, this eager loading pattern will also load with lazy loading turned on. If lazy loading is on and you eager load something, then in that case the um, eager load of items will be loaded there and then in the same query and the um, ones that aren't included here will be um, loaded by the dynamic proxy as before. Finally, you do have the ability to manually load uh, navigation collections. 
So in this case, I've got a context where the lazy loading has been turned off and I've loaded a student record. Because lazy loading is off, if I look at the enrollment collection, it's null. Even though I've done that, I have the ability to this piece of code here, loads Entity Frameworks internal entry for my object. I could then go collections with a navigation with a expression which gives me the reference to that particular collection dot load and that will load that collection by firing a database query obviously if you're doing this loading inside a loop you're going to get the same n plus one problem as you would get with lazy loading so to recap all the entity framework concepts seen in the demonstration First of all, the thing to understand is the DB context. The DB context is the core system within Entity Framework that does the actual persisting. It does that by loading entities into memory and tracking its state. The states of an entity within a DB context are the following. Added, which means that you've taken a new entity, a new object, and you've attached it to Entity Framework, and it's now in the added state. It will be inserted into the database when you call save changes. Unchanged means you've loaded something from the database into the entity framework memory but it hasn't been changed yet. Modified, it's been loaded from the database, it's in the entity, entity memory and it's since been modified and entity framework is tracking those changes. Deleted means it's been loaded from database into entity framework memory and you've specifically said I'm going to delete this record Next time you call safe changes, NCF framework will issue a delete statement through the database. And finally, detached. That's when you've loaded an item into entity framework memory, but you've since closed that, that context, that database DB context. So that object is um, in your memory. You can use it, you can manipulate it, but you can't save those changes back without reattaching it to a new uh, DB context. So key to understanding how Entity Framework works is to understand how it tracks changes. And the other concepts you saw were lazy loading and dynamic proxies. Understanding those is crucial to understanding performance. Also with lazy loading and all work around Entity Framework, you need to understand the DB context. And you've seen that if you close the DB context early, then lazy loading doesn't work. So you have to decide how you're gonna manage a DB context and one particular pattern that I use a lot in web is context per request. So that means you keep your DB context open for the last stuff of request. The final thing you saw were Entity Framework code first migrations and how Entity Framework can read the state of your configuration and your entities, build an internal model of that configuration and generate SQL and schema changes to match that model. Okay, so so far I've talked a little bit of background about Onion Architecture and the core concepts. And I've also shown you quite a few features of Entity Framework. So the next phase of this talk is to try and bring those things together. And what I'm going to introduce is a library we produced at SSW. It's um, freely available on GitHub and it's called Data Onion. And the whole goal of this is to bring these two concepts together. One thing we found over a few projects um, trying to implement um, Onion Architecture with Entity Framework is that although Entity Framework itself does inside its own implementation have quite a few concepts such as the DB context that's kind of a repository and unit of work pattern all rolled into one, we found that it didn't exactly match up to how we wanted to have the interfaces set up to better follow Onion Architecture practices. So what we came up with was our own repository interfaces and implementations that then themselves used Entity Framework. And also over time, as we were doing this more and more, we found that doing that did create a bit of work. We were um, doing a lot of boilerplate code. So the final solution we came up with for Data Onion was code generation. In a nutshell, what we do is we read your domain entities, we then generate some basic repository interfaces class, classes, and then we generate a standard repository implementation. So 
So when it came to designing our repository implementation for Data Onion, we had a few decisions to make in how to go about it. And the very first decision was leakiness. How much of the underlying entity framework DB context features do we expose beyond that repository? And what we decided was we definitely wanted to have the ability to run ad hoc queries. That was too useful to lock behind forcing custom functions we were in every time you wanted to query something. So we, the way we do that is just simply expose iQueryable through an interface. Um, it was decided that even there are plenty of other um, persistence engines that also provide iQueryable. So adding that as a feature wouldn't lock us out from switching to other implementation in the future. Say for example, in Hibernate, if you wanted to take our repository implementation and just redo the backend engine within Hibernate, that would be possible because that does provide an iQueryable interface. The next thing we looked at was good ways of managing and creating our DB context instances when inside a dependency injection framework. And so what we eventually came up with was a DB context factory implementation that's in charge of creating contexts and a DB context manager implementation that's in charge of um, looking after that context lifecycle. And then those are implemented in a way that integrate with the, the lifecycle management of your dependency injection framework. When it came to unit of work, what we're pretty much just doing is wrapping the unit of work provided by DB context. But we did in a couple of our systems have multiple databases involved. So our unit of work implementation here will allow you to have multiple DB contexts and wrap, basically it's just a wrap around those DB contexts and all cool save changes or rollback on all those DB contexts within that one unit of work. Finally, to manage those resources, what we expose is our disposable. So if you call dispose on our DB context manager, that will dispose the underlying units of work, the underlying DB contexts as expected. The next decision that was made in Data Onion implementation was in generating our repositories. Now there are plenty of um, repository patterns on the internet that use generic repositories and those work quite well. But we decided not to go with that route because when you generate specific classes for each of your entities, you get a place to put your code. So basically um, every single repository implementation we generate is a partial class. So that gives you your entry point to add your own methods to those repository implementations and those repository interfaces. So pretty much what we give you is a scaffold that works quite well for your basic CRUD operations, but it's intended that where you need to, you've got that extension point ready for you to add your own faster code as required. Now what we generate are three things. If you remember inside your DB context, each of those, um, each of your entity classes need to be referenced with a DB set. So we generate that. We also generate a repository interface implementation. And uh, yeah, we also generate repository interfaces and we generate the classes that implement those repository interfaces. Okay, so let's look at our same solution, but now we've got Data Onion added. Um, here you can see our previous vanilla entity framework projects. They're still there, but they're no longer being used. We've now got quite a few more projects. We've got a data interfaces project that contains our generated repository implementations. We've got a dependency resolution project that contains our autofact configuration. We've got a domain project that contains straightforward uh, plain .NET entities. Then we've got our entity framework Data Onion project. As before, it's got a, a DB context and it's got a drop create creator. But we've also got our generated DB context fragment and our repository implementations. So next, let's look at our generated classes. So we generate three things. Um, a partial containing the DB context, um, repository implementations, and the interfaces. A look at the generated DB context. 
you can see that all these references to my entity types have been placed in that partial class. And then for each repository implementation, we've just got a little implementation that overrides our base implementation. And then for each repository concrete class, again, we just override our standard base repository. But the key to point out is every single class there is partial to give us the ability to add our own behavior both to the interfaces and to the implementations. So let's look at the configuration for one of our um, generators. We've, as you've seen, we've got three generators. I'll just walk you through one of them. They've got very similar settings. Um, the three different ones are required simply because we want to be able to put our three sets of classes in different projects. So if I open up a configuration file, we've got a basic set of functions here. The first one, let's specify a base entity class. So if we've got a base entity class that all our persistent classes inherit, then we can specify it there and also provide a DLL of where to load that. Then we have our DLL of where to load our domain from. So this will be a reference back to our domain DLL. And then the namespace within that DLL we're going to load our classes from. And finally, the um, project namespace for the repository implementations themselves. So that's what, what's going to appear in the generated classes. Finally, this function is quite useful. It's a little func that um, lets us control what type. So beyond the list of types, by default we'll load all types from this DLL and underneath this namespace. In this case, the default function is don't include abstract classes and don't include sealed classes. We can add any extra rules on the end of this to specify what we are and are not going to include in the list of types we're going to create repositories for. So next I'm going to show you the dependency resolution project and that configures our dependency injection engine. Um, so basically whatever startup project we're using at the time, all the dependencies that needs are the interfaces. So it's going to have a dependency on the domain, it's going to have a dependency on the data interfaces and any other interface classes you need. But then for the concrete implementations, the only reference it needs is this reference to the dependency resolution project. And then the actual concrete types loaded at runtime to perform the required operations will be handled via this dependency resolution and dependency injection. So opening up our dependency resolution project, we've got a single autofact module called the date render module. And this is the system that loads, wires up all our entity framework dependencies. Of course, once you start working with dependency injection, the key thing you want to start doing is any dependency between um, components, you want to start injecting them as constructor parameters. And even this configuration file is no different. So the one piece, one dependency that this configuration file has is a connection string. So we inject that connection string into our data under module as a private constructor parameter. And then we move on down to our configuration for data onion. So moving down to the actual configuration for data onion. The concept of constructor injection to get parts of the system to communicate with each other and to inject dependencies has been applied right down the chain. So even classes in Entity Framework that don't naturally have a constructor injection pattern have been, we've added our own code around that to make that happen. So walking down through these configurations, the first thing we've got is a database initializer. As you can see, I've switched this one back to the drop create always initializer, but that's where you can put in your migrations initializer or whatever option you want to put in, in there yourself. Then building on top of the initializer, we've got a context factory. <coughs> the context factory is in charge of making new DB context instances using our initializer. Then we've got a DB man context manager. The role of the manager is looking after the life cycle of our DB context. And as you can see, we've got one configuration option here, instance per lifetime scope. Under a web context, that means we get the context per request life cycle. 
Next we've got our unit of work, which is the data onion unit of work that allows us to group multiple DB contexts into a single unit of work. And then finally we've got an assembly scan. We grab the assembly containing our repository implementations, assembly containing our repository interfaces, and then this as implemented interfaces will configure all of those from the scan using a convention. So next I have pulled this source code one more step forward by grabbing another tag from GitHub. And now I, we have a web UI layer wired into our system. So what this means is we have a web layer. The web layer has a dependency on our interfaces, our dependency resolution, and our domain, but it does not have a direct dependency on our actual implementation classes underneath. What that means in practice, if I go to a controller and open up a very simple controller, I now have the ability to inject the repository and unit of work into my controller and use these independently of the background implementation of those repositories. And in this simple case, I can call repository.get just to fetch all records. I can call repository.find to find an individual record by ID. And I can also load, make changes, and save. So let's see that in action on the web. Okay, so I'm not looking to win any design awards here. I've got a very basic, um, standard MVC bootstrap project that I've got an index file in an index page and an edit, I can click the edit page, go to edit URL, make a change, hit save, and that change is applied. Let's take another look at the controllers behind that. So what we've got here is a as basic as possible um, implementation of using these domain entities in a web context but straight away there's something I don't like and one of the problems is around about here I am binding my persistent entities directly to objects in the view and then posting back HTTP posts and bind them straight to entity classes again so what happens here is at this point in time, round about here, this model object is of type student. So it looks like it came from the database, but it didn't. This was built on the fly from MVC's data binding engine. It'd be very easy for me to try and feed that entity straight back into entity framework and have all kinds of things go wrong. What I need to actually do is load a genuine persistent entity of that, copy the values across, and then save it. So what I generally recommend doing, as much as I dislike it because it means you're having to repeat yourself, is use some kind of view model. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate next. Okay, so after another update of the code, I've now built the same functionality, but now I'm using a view model. And what I like about view models is that at this point here, it's very clear to me um, that what I've injected, what I've um, loaded from a HTTP post here is a view model, and I need to do some work to convert that view model into my entity. So this class here is my view model for a student, and the role of a view model really is a representation of that entity for use in a single screen or web form. So for example, in this case, um, my edit screen for the student doesn't contain all the enrollments, so we don't have the enrollments there. What we do have is the fields that are gonna be used on screen in that particular view. Now, one of the disadvantages of using a view model is of course that you have to declare all your fields again. So I've already in a previous class declared that first name is string, last name is a string. But um, once you move beyond a very, very simple example. I think the gains in clarity of always converting to a view model and sending that view model to the screen 
outweigh the, the losses in the fact that you have to repeat yourself. Of course, as soon as you have these um, entities and view models, you then need to be able to convert between them. And that's what I've created this mapper interface and implementation for. So like everything, I always try and build an interface first, clearly defined what that interface has to do, and then I build the implementation. So when it comes to mapping between your domain entities and your view models, um, one option is of course AutoMapper to automatically generate that mapping code for you. Personally, I find that when you use something like AutoMapper, you get 89% of your code written for you and that's great. But at the end of the day, you end up with that few percent where you get far more difficult bugs to debug. So I've now gone to the step of pretty much everything I write, I'll just write my own mapper. But given that, there's a few tricks you can do to make that a little bit faster. So one thing you can do when you are taking um, persistent entities and converting them to view models, um, one thing to consider is that they are considerably faster if you can use the projection from Entity Framework and project from your query directly into that view model. It's not something you can always do, but if you can, it works great. So in this case, we've got our student repository and our student repository has a get function that returns our queryable of students. Now at that point, that database query has not been executed. That database query is still in our queryable. It's still waiting for us to actually call a function that requires it to execute. So what we can do at this point is call a select and then select into a projection. So if we select into a new student view model and then we're mapping fields from our database directly into our view model, then what happens is when this query runs, first of all, the query will only select the fields in this projection and those projected fields will be converted straight into this view model without actually loading our entities in the interim. So we don't add those entities to our track change tracking engine inside Entity Framework. Now, when you are writing these projections, it's worth remembering that this expression here will be converted into an SQL query filed against a database. So you are slightly limited on what exactly you can put inside this expression. For example, if I was querying against a list of items, I could quite easily put dot to string. Or if there was a date, I could easily convert the date to a string inside the expression. But if I'm talking to Entity Framework uh, with this link statement, those functions won't work. So when talking about converting your entities to view models, there is one option here that does let you put pretty much any code inside your select statement, and that is calling to list. Now quite often it gets into your mind as a developer, oh, I can make this work by adding to list to my query. But it's very, very dangerous. Because what happens here is this code here by itself is at this point that the, that the underlying database query is executed. And when that query executes, it'll fetch every single record in the table and every single field. Where previously, without this to list, our select statement is only fetching the fields we specifically asked for. Here, we're loading them all into memory creating full-on objects and then copying those objects across. Sometimes you have to do some kind of version, um, conversion inside here, um, but if you really do have to, I would definitely consider using take and skip before you call that to list so that you've got some pagination going on. But by all means, I definitely encourage you to, whenever possible, avoid that hack and build select statements that are compatible with Entity Framework. So there's one more thing I want to show you around this mapping area. 
and that's I'm um, reusing these projections. So this statement here, everything inside the select can be declared as a separate object, which means you can then reuse it in more places. So if I take the contents of this select projection, put it in this object here, I can replace this code with a simple a simple reference to that projection. I can then reuse that same projection in multiple places. So this particular function gets me an iQueryable list of student view models for display on an index page. Elsewhere, I'm loading a single one, a single view model for my edit screen. And for that one, I'm just calling the projection.compiler invoke. So I'm loading an entity from the database as a single get by ID, and I convert it to the same view model using the same projection code for this code line. So this one projection is now reused across multiple places within my view model, once for building a list of them, and then once for converting a single entity from an entity to this view model. One more feature I want to show you of this particular view mapper information is actually all the work of saving to and from the database is performed inside this view model mapper so that it's the mapper class that has dependency on the repository and therefore it does the loading and saving so we load the view model by id behind the scenes it will load the entity convert to view model and return us the view model when it comes to saving we take a view model in this gets saved to database without our con con without our invoking controller needing to know about the repository at all so when we look at how that then works inside the controller, our controller has a dependency on the mapper. So rather than our controller being the central store of everything that does everything, all our controller does is take view models from the, from the screen, in this case, in a HTTP post, and send them back to the mapper. And then to look at things, we get a request to view an item. All we do is send that ID through the view model mapper, get a view model out and send it to the view. So what I like about this particular implementation is just how small our controllers are. No longer do we have massive controllers that are doing all the work. All the controllers are focused on is what the web bit is, which is getting view models from the web as a big stream from HTTP, pushing it through to a mapper, and then it's, it's moved on to the next level. So one more demonstration of how important it is to get your projections right is here on this home page. As you can see on this home page, we've got some, a list of students, and for each student we've got a first name and last name, and then some counts. And both of these items are navigation properties, navigation collections, hanging off the um, student record. Now, if we were just iterating through our students as loaded entities from the framework and then following standard lazy loading navigation properties across two activities, we'd be looking at two queries per person plus the initial query to load. Once you multiply that out by a number of students, you're looking at a lot of database queries being fired. If you get the projection right, and in our case, what we've done is first of all, we've created a view model that maps exactly what I want to see on the screen. So the view model follows what you want to see, and you can see that here, those counts are, integer, are ints, integers on that view model. And next we've got our projection right to make sure that we fire just one query, and that query contains the aggregates to count those items. Now to prove to yourself that that's right, that you've only run in one query, a great first place to look is Glimpse. So right here I've got my Glimpse toolbar and if I hit reload just to make sure down here in Glimpse you've got some feedback on the database queries. In this case you can see it spent hardly any time running database queries and it only ran one query. So straight up here's a very good way of keeping track of how many queries are being executed in order to build your one view. Obviously, moving beyond that, you really want a good performance monitoring story 
to see how where you pump performance bottlenecks are. So that pretty much covers the demonstrations I've got time for today. Um, but everything you've seen, all the code and the tests and demonstrations are all available on GitHub under the Brendan-SSW account in one of my repositories. And also all, all the different steps, so each demonstration pretty much a different step, they're all tagged under various tags. If you use Git to fetch the various tags, you'll be able to run the code at various points within the presentation.